Welcome to each of you this morning. If you're new to the church, I'm Pastor Bill. Great to, great to be here with you guys. Uh, and once again, if you are visiting, we have a, a, a church lunch every Sunday, so you're welcome to stay and join us. So um, gr- great food providers here in our, in our church family. So. We are this morning in uh, the Gospel of Luke, uh, the third book in the New Testament. We are in chapter 14, and this is a... Uh, wonderful, wonderful section of scripture that we're going to look at. It's all wonderful, but it's, uh, this is really, ooh, I'm getting a kind of Wizard of Oz voice here, aren't I? (laughs) Ignore the man behind the curtain. (laughs) With a voice like that, you should be teaching the book of Revelation, right? It's like, ooh, it's kind of (laughs) big and boomy. We are in the book of, uh, book of Luke, chapter 14, and uh, we see seemingly Two contrasting ideas, but I'm going to submit to you that they are really tied together in a great way. So uh, let me offer up a word of prayer, and we'll ask the Lord to bless his word to our hearts, to our minds. Lord, thank you for your word so much that we don't have to wander through this life blind, reaching out for something to hang on to. Uh, But Lord, your word says that uh, about itself, that it's an anchor for our souls. So thank you for that. And we pray that you'd speak to our hearts today and that our hearts would be open to you. In Jesus' name. I thought Jose did a wonderful job last week in teaching. Whoa. (laughs) He did a fantastic job uh, teaching. uh, And this... What we're looking at uh, this morning comes right on the heels of where he left off. Uh, He left off about uh, a a dinner that was given for Jesus, and there were Pharisees there, and a man who was crippled, and Jesus healed the man, so on and so forth. We pick up the story, um, and also, excuse me, he told a parable. It's kind of loud, James. Can you turn it down just a little bit? Usually I like all the volume, but it's kind of, yeah. Um, That's great. Thank you. He told a parable about a, a, a rich man who gave a banquet and invited many people, and ma- people made excuses. They didn't want to go to the banquet, and they were, they were terrible excuses, as Jose pointed out. And, the, and the, the rich man, the master of the feast, sent out his servants again and said, I don't, want, I don't want an empty table. I don't want an empty house. Go find other people. And they made excuses, and, and he, just, he just kept sending them out to gather people in to his feast. And Jose made a wonderful point that this is symbolic of that time when the, the, the body of Christ, when Christians go to be with the Lord, that there's going to be a fellowship meal, the Bible even describes it, a time when we sit down, actually sit down with Jesus Christ and all the other believers, and it's God's heart uh, and, and a deep, deep desire of God to gather people to himself, that they would enjoy having relationship and friendship with him. So it's right on the heels of that that we pick up the story here in verse 25. Uh, Now great multitudes went with him. And he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, his own life, he cannot be uh, my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Or else while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor for the dung hill, but men throw it out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. It seems like Jesus here, and I'm going to be a little tongue-in-cheek, a little bit silly, it seems like he's almost schizophrenic here. If you're reading casually, On the one hand, he's saying, come to the feast, come to the feast, come to the feast. And on the other hand, he says, but if you do, you have to forsake everything. 
I really want you here. God, God the Father really wants you here. God the Son really wants you here. God the Holy Spirit really wants We really want you here. We're sending out the invitation. Please come. We're inviting you. We've made a way for you to come. But if you come, you better leave everything behind. And there's this high call of discipleship. There's this high call of forsaking everything else. And in some ways, it, I think to the casual reader, it, it could almost seem um, like those two ideas are opposed to each other, but, but they're really not. So Jesus, as I said, had just finished teaching this parable about inviting people to this great banquet, and the master was almost insistent that his servants go out and, and give the invitations. And so uh, upon hearing that or, or hearing about it, verse 25, great multitudes went with them. So the people are hearing Jesus, and, and maybe they didn't hear this particular story because he was at a dinner but they're hearing things about him, and they want to follow him. And Jesus here, you guys, does not allow for easy believism. Perhaps you've, you've seen uh, church services on television, social media, you know, whatever the case may be. And, and it's like the pastor won't end the service till everybody's come forward and cried or something. You know, he's, he's just going to go on and on. And he's, he's giving what is called an altar call, an opportunity for, for people to come forward and say, yes, I've decided that I want to follow Jesus Christ and I recognize that I've sinned against God and I want his forgiveness. And, and he's, you know, only five people come forward. So he says, well, I'm going to give you another opportunity, you know. And he keeps doing it until finally everybody feels so emotionally manipulated. It's like, we want to go home. Everybody, just come forward, you know. Let's, let's make this pastor happy and so we can get out of here, you know. You know, the restaurant's going to close soon. I want some dessert, you know. And it's like, and I've been to services like, have you guys seen services like that? It just, the pastor seems manipulative, you know. And even some, you know, sadly, um, not all, certainly not all, but I, even some pastors will even <clears throat> brag about how many decisions have been made for G, to, to for people to turn to Jesus Christ over the years. There was one pastor in town some years ago. I went to visit him in his office, and, uh, boy, am I getting myself in trouble here? <laughs> I'm not naming names, okay? <laughs> but he even had, like, newspaper clippings back when we used to read the newspaper up on, the, on his office about, how, you know, how many people are, you know, coming to Christ. And, he, and he, he knew how many thousands of people had received Jesus Christ, you know, and, he's, and he was happy to tell me about it. Now, now, Anybody should be happy, and part of what we're going to look at today is that we should rejoice when people do turn to God, absolutely rejoice. But sometimes people, quote-unquote, turn to God because they're being manipulated, and because, honestly, they, you know, the ushers won't open the door, still everybody's gone forward, that kind of idea. Jesus never, Jesus never begged anybody to follow him. He invites, he invites, he invites, he pleads, he reasons with people, he talks to them, but then he says, if you're going to follow me, I have to be number one. I'm not desperate for you to follow me. I'm desperate that you be saved. I'm desperate that you be forgiven. I'm desperate that you have a change of mind and a change of heart, but you're not going to come to me on your, on your terms. You're coming on my terms. So it's very interesting to me how, how quickly, at least in the scriptures, and there's, there may have been some time between, uh, you know, and I'm sure there was some time between the dinner at the Pharisee's house and this event here, but in the scriptures it goes from one thing right to the next, and it's very interesting to me that both things are absolutely true. God loves humanity. If you have any, any doubt at all today about that, dear, dear people, God loves you so deeply more than you'll ever know, he loves you. He's very concerned about your life. And he wants you to understand that you need him. Jesus is not just a little bit of spice that we add to our life or call upon him when we're, when we're in a jam. It's that kind of thing. Jesus is to be preeminent in our lives. Not just, not just an addition. And he desperately wants to have life with you. But you can't come on your terms. You have to come on his terms. And that's what he says here. Verse 26, he, Jesus teaches by way of, of, of contrast and, and, and an extreme, extreme contrast. And you need to understand the heart of, of this teaching lest there be any confusion. Verse 26, if anyone comes to me, now these people are following him. And he just, it's almost like he just turn, stops and turns around and just says, okay, everybody, ho hold on a second. Just wait a second. I just got to say something. If you want to follow me, I'm number one. 
I'm, I'm more important than your mother, your father, your wife, your husband, your kids, your grandkids, your friends, your job, your career, your hobbies, your finances, your investments, uh, your, 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 seat, your, uh, you know, your music collection. I, I'm, more impor- I'm more important than your car, more important than your boat, ladies, whatever you, you do. I'm more important than your sewing machine. I'm more important, <laughs> I'm more important than all. I'm number one. I am number one. If you're not okay with that, you can go now. There's no ease of believism. He desperately wants them. But it has to be on his terms. And he says in verse 26, if anyone comes to me, does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and yes, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now look at your notes if you would. At number two there, Jesus calls for total commitment. And he taught by way of extreme comparison. Now, Now we need to consider what the whole Bible says. Exodus 20, verse 12, and this is in the Ten Commandments, the Bible says, honor your father and your mother. So we are absolutely to honor our fathers and our mothers. If your parents are still alive, honor them and love them and serve them and care for them as much as you can. I know there's always many, many different extenuating circumstances. Do your best to honor them. If if they've died already, still honor them the best that you can. Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. And so Jesus gave himself sacrificially for us. Husbands are to do the same thing for their wives. So Jesus here is teaching by way of comparison. He's not going against what the Bible says. He's saying, in essence, this. Compared to the love that you have for them, your love for me should make that love almost look like hate. That, That your love for me is so much greater. He's calling for extreme devotion here, absolute devotion. Jesus' main point is this. If we want to follow him, our love and devotion for him must exceed our love and devotion to all others. There have been many people, guys, over the years, I've seen it, you've seen it. They've been among us here at this church or other churches perhaps, and, um, you know, they're lonely, or they, they want to get in business with somebody. There's a great business opportunity to make some money, or there's, a, you know, there's a, a potential for marriage, perhaps, or friendship, or something else, and uh, they start compromising in their lives, and they're gone. So Jesus is calling for absolute uh, commitment. Verse 27 <clears throat> Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. The cross was the Roman instrument of death. If you saw somebody carrying their cross, guys, it it was a one-way trip. They would never come back. They would never come back. And it was excruciating. In fact, the word uh, excruciating from the Latin is excruciat. It means out from the cross. That's where we get that word in English. Excruciating, it means out from the cross. That which the cross produces in somebody excruciating pain. And it was, it was, uh, it was the, the way the Romans killed people in public to intimidate uh, the citizenry and to maintain control in the nation of Israel. But notice that Jesus, now, now under, under Roman rule, uh, the Romans would force the cross upon you. So you had no choice. If they deemed that you were guilty of capital offense, they would force you to carry the cross. But Jesus isn't forcing you to carry the cross. He's saying, if you want to follow me, there's a cross over there. Go go pick it up. Follow me. You're you're saying goodbye to self-determination. You're saying goodbye to self-rule. You're saying this, I'm no longer in charge of my life. Jesus is in charge of my life. And dear friends, we've seen, as I said, a lot of people over the years that have been among us that are no longer among us. And I'm not just talking about the local church. I'm talking about the Christian family in Napa. How, how many of you know people that are, that are no longer walking with Jesus? Probably everybody in, in here could put up their hand. And you would have been sure that, wow, they're just so strong. Somebody came along or a situation came along or somebody hurt them, maybe even a pastor hurt them. And so they said, you know, 
the pain that I'm feeling is greater than my devotion for Jesus, therefore I'm going to depart from the church of Jesus. Or that person is giving me such instant gratification, even though they're not a Christian, I'm going to depart from Jesus because I'm just really lonely. Or here's a great career opportunity, and they're asking me to cut some corners and be a little bit dishonest, but this is a great thing, I can support my family, so on and so forth. And there's so many reasons that people will depart from Jesus. And Jesus is saying, if you're going to follow me, I'm number one. And if you're not willing to do that, th then don't follow me. He's almost uninviting some people in a way. And it's interesting because at the parable of the banquet, he's desperately wanting them. But it's not easy believism. Verse 28, once again, which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cows whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he laid the foundation is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him. And they're saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Jesus is just simply saying, you know, an architect or, or, or a construction guy or somebody that's going to build a tower, he considers what he's getting into. And Jesus is telling this crowd, you need to consider what you're getting into. If you want to follow me, I demand everything. Now, does he wipe us out if we falter? No, of course not. If you've given your life to Jesus, we all falter. But when we falter, we recognize it and we say, Lord, sorry, uh, I kind of started setting the cross down a bit. I'm putting it back on my shoulder. I'm walking forward again. And it's that intention that needs to be maintained. That it's... I'm, you're, you're not called to self-rule. Guys, if you're going to follow Jesus, you're not in charge anymore. You've got to give it up. Otherwise, otherwise, he's basically saying, you're not worthy to be my disciple. I was thinking last night, I was kind of trying to figure out how to say this. I think being a Christian is probably the hardest thing in the world. I, in this way. Uh, the Republican Party doesn't demand that I forsake everything. The Republican Party doesn't tell me I can't overindulge with, you know, and have three gallons of ice cream. The, you know, the Republican Party, the Democrat Party doesn't say I can't uh, hang out with these kinds of people. Just as long as we get your vote and your money, we can maintain a relationship. Political parties, they don't, they don't force me to, they, they, don't, they don't say, uh, you know, Donald Trump hasn't called me up lately and said, to make sure uh, you're not lying anymore. I haven't heard from him. Don't expect to. Jesus is always doing this and saying, tell the truth, Bill, always. In fact, Donald Trump doesn't come to me and say, make sure your thoughts are pure and clean. Jesus is always saying, hey, your thought life. Every little thing. The way, the way I, my facial expression when I wave at my neighbor and his barking dog. I don't have a neighbor with a barking dog. It's hypothetical, okay? Actually, we were the neighbor with the barking dog <laughs> for a long time, okay? The Spirit of God, when you say yes to Jesus, the Spirit of God comes inside of you and examines every single little thing, every motive, every word, every action, every desire, how you spend your money, who you hang out with, what you put before your eyes, what you put in your ears, what you put in your body. Everything is under His scrutiny, and you have to say yes to Him all of the time. No political party, no sports team asked me to do that. Certainly no um, Hollywood movie stars asked me to do that. My friends don't ask me to do that. My wife doesn't even ask me to do that. She's a little closer, but she doesn't ask me to do that. But God searches out my heart all the time, and he says, if you're not, if you're not willing, Bill, to, to pick up your cross, you're not my disciple. And then the word disciple means a follower or a learner. And so Jesus calls for absolute devotion. And in that sense, I think being a Christian is probably the hardest thing to do. You know, Joe and I can be friends, and we are friends. We're, we're still friends? Okay. We'll see how I do today. But I can't crawl inside his head and tell him what to think, and he can't crawl inside my head and tell me what to think. But Jesus can. And, it, and, and the standards of Jesus are perfect. And I'm not saved because I do them perfectly, obviously. He died on a cross to forgive me of my sins. But if I'm going to follow him, I have to constantly not just come forward and be baptized, not just show up at church and, and kind of do it on Sunday and six days a week. I'm kind of self-rule the other six days a week. No, it's 24-7 for the rest of my life. And that's what it means to follow Jesus. That's the call to discipleship. Didn't Jesus say himself that many will come to him and say, Lord, Lord, you know, we visited you in prison and we, we fed you and we clothed you. And Jesus is going to say, you know what? I never knew you. 
He did some things, but we never had a relationship. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. It's a horrible thing. So Jesus, it's just, it's just amazing to me. The parable is like, please come into the blanket, bank, banquet blanket. Please come into the, to the banquet. But if you do, you have to give everything up. And you don't even deserve a place at the banquet table. And you can't buy a place at the banquet table. And you can't earn a place at the banquet table. It's freely given to you because I have died for your sins so that you could be forgiven. But if you come, 100%, that's what I'm asking for. And a lot of people that we know are no longer, you know, apparently following Jesus. There's nothing about their life that looks like that. You have to wonder if they, if they didn't count the cost. Verse 31, what king going to war to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for a condition of peace. Makes sense, doesn't it? Am I able to do this? There might be some here that, you know, I don't know everybody uh, super, super well. There might be some here that haven't yet said yes to Jesus, and you're kind of thinking about it. I wonder, I wonder, well, now you have more information to work on, to work with. If you decide to follow Jesus, the, it's, it's, the, it's the death of your self-rule. It's the death of your self-determination. Friendships, how you spend your money, all those things that I've mentioned already. Even thought life, even words, everything. Verse 33, so likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. And by the way, Jesus did say, I missed something here. Back up in verse 26, uh, he talks about father, mother, wife, children, brother, sister. And in case, in case I missed anything, Jesus would say, yeah, even your own life. <laughs> in case I glossed over anything. Even your own life. It's the end of self-rule. And the end of self-rule is a beautiful thing. I'm glad to not rule myself as much as I used to. It wasn't good. It was always chaos in the White House in, in my life. Okay. I, love, I love following Christ. He never leads me into problematic areas. No war stories this morning. If you're waiting for gory details, you're not going to hear them, Okay. Hey, but you know what? I'm glad to follow Jesus. I never get in trouble when I follow Jesus. I'm never disappointed. I'm never let down. It's not easy because there's a big part of me that still wants to be in charge. Huge part. But I've learned over the years, the more that I surrender, the better off I am. A friend of mine, a friend of ours, many of us know uh, this gal. She, she said something once that really impacted me. She says, you know, when you surrender, you're joining the winning side. Isn't that great? When you surrender, you're joining the winning side. But that, that means you recognize, I don't have what it takes, and he is greater than I am. Now, Jesus says something really interesting, and, and I've, I've read this verse for years, and I, I love how the Bible is a living, a live book. It's powerful. It, it helps us to think through things. I used to just stumble at these verses, 34 and 35. I couldn't see how it fit in. And maybe uh, you guys will have an epiphany yourselves today. But he's been giving us the terms of discipleship. He's been giving us the terms of the relationship. And then he says, salt is good, but if salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It's neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill, but men throw it out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And I used to think, what in the world does that mean? <laughs> like, did you just like have a brain fade and just like the synapses closed down and you woke up somewhere else? It's like, what are you talking about? But he's basically saying this, salt is useful as long as it's salty. And it's really interesting, last night I looked up, and you guys are way more knowledgeable than I am, but salt can never be unsalty. Physical salt, the salt that we have in our homes, it can never lose its saltiness, physically speaking, chemically speaking. You can dilute it if there's too much salt in the soup, you know, you put it in a little cream or water or something else. But salt will never lose its saltiness, physically speaking. But apparently, spiritually speaking, you can be salty and then start compromising. And then you lose your saltiness. And then what, what usefulness is, is there to your life in the kingdom of God? This is hard. None. There's no usefulness to your life in the kingdom of God. I'm not saying at that point a person is 
not a Christian anymore? They lost their salvation or they walked away from their salvation or something like that? Let's just, let's just let it say what it says, shall we? Jesus said, if you're going to be my disciple, in essence this, you've got to be salty. You've got to be 100% for me. And salt, if it loses its saltiness, it's not useful anymore. And I think Jesus is saying this, don't lose your saltiness. That's how do we lose our saltiness? He's given us a list. You love people more. You love things more. You start to fade away. I realize that this creates a big theological debate for some people within the, Christ, within the body of Christ. I was taught uh, by Pastor Chuck Smith, my, my pastor who ordained me, just teach what's in front of you. <laughs> so that's what it says, doesn't it? Look, at, consider this. <clears throat> let, let me paraphrase verse 34, if I may. Following Jesus is good, but if, you lose your, but if you quit following him, how can you be changed again? It's kind of a frightening thought, isn't it? You are neither fit for this or that or the other thing. You just kind of become useless in the kingdom of God. There's a warning tucked in there somewhere, isn't there? There's a sober words. We're going to get into chapter 15 in case you thought, oh, good, praise the Lord, he's ending early. We're not. <laughs> uh, it has been said, and, and we like to say it, uh, the word of God is inspired, the chapter divisions are not, you know. And so uh, we're going to keep going here a little bit. These ideas are all uh, tied together. Then all the tax collectors, we're in, we're in Luke chapter 15, verse, verse 1. Then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him to hear him. These are the worst of the worst. When you read tax collectors and sinners, these are the worst of the worst in that society. And the Pharisees and scribes, and those were the religious, ultra-conservative, right-wing, you know, look-down-your-nose kind of, kind of folks. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them. Now, a parable is a heavenly story or excuse me, an earthly story that illustrates a heavenly truth. Whenever you see a parable, it's often uh, presented as the kingdom of heaven is like or God's love is like. So it's a, it's a similarity kind of thing. So Jesus here is going to talk once again about how desperately and deeply God loves people. I want you to notice <clears throat> the parable of the banquet. I love people. I want everybody. Please come, please come, please come to me. But if you come, leave it all behind. I desperately want you. Don't let anything keep you from me. But if you come, 100%. Now he's going back, but I want you, I want you, I want you. It's just like the two things are going back and forth through these passages. It's very interesting to me. So these guys are, are upset. Um, verse 1, the tax collectors and sinners. It's interesting that Luke uses the word then, after Jesus told this story about leaving everything behind and coming to me, it says, then the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him to hear him. Now, it could have been a later then, or it could have been like an immediate then. The tax collectors and sinners were despised by the religious establishment, but what did they, what did they now understand? That God wanted them. The Pharisees didn't want them. The scribes didn't want them. The Calvary Chapel pastors didn't want them. The Catholic priests didn't want them. The Lutheran priests didn't want them. The Episcopal pastors didn't want them. But God wants them. God wants them. They're understanding that now. Guys, I don't know if you've ever been in a, in a group. I think some of you have, know this feeling, some of you that as I've talked to you. You've ever been in the kind of place in life where nobody wants you. You may have kind of just destroyed your life and nobody, just everybody's turning away from you. You're just, you're like, you're off limits to most people. They don't, you know, they just don't want to be around you. And they just think lowly of you. And these guys now understand that God loves them. So they come. They do near to hear him. Verse one and two. The tax collectors and sinners drew near to him to hear him. The Pharisees complained. The Pharisees, guys, were notoriously self-righteous. 
I don't need God. I'm a good person. Or I might, I might do a few things here and there, but overall, you know, I'm, I'm a good person. I don't, I don't really need a Messiah. I don't really need Jesus. I'm a good person. And these other guys were like, we had no idea that God loved us. We had no idea that we could be accepted. and go to, We had no idea we could go to heaven. Like, they're they probably saying things like, are you kidding me? God would love us? The tax collectors, guys, were Jews who worked for the nation of Rome, and they were extorting money from their, from their Jewish brothers and sisters, and they were p- collecting taxes for Rome, but they would extort, they would ask for more than, than the tax was, and they would line their pockets with it. They were hated. They were absolutely hated in that culture. And the sinners is just a code word for drunks and prostitutes and everybody else. They were hated. Who are they especially hated by? The super right conservative religious people. You know, I have a bad habit. You are going to hear a war story now. (laughs) Now that I have your attention. I have a, I was wondering if I should be so open with my life at times. You know, sometimes they tell you as a pastor, don't be too open with your life because people will point fingers at you. I I kind of, I'm getting older and I kind of don't care anymore. And I have realized recently, you know, I, I think a little more highly of myself than I really should, you know. I think I'm willing to buy that guy, a, that bum on the street, I'm willing to bend down and talk to him and, I'm, I'm, you know, we'll go buy him a burrito and a Coke and I'll sit and chat with him for a while. And I'm okay kind of with homeless people. I'm not super afraid of them and everything. But you know what happens then? Then I look around and start despising everybody else that didn't do it. What's up with that? <laughs> And I go, I'm a Pharisee. (laughs) Sometimes. (laughs) When we we look down our noses at other people, whether whether they are the bum on the street or the rich guy that didn't help the bum on the street, you're a Pharisee. You think you're better than other people. Pharisees come in all different shapes and sizes, don't they? And I'm like, oh, Lord, I I was feeling so good about myself. And you had to go reveal this thing about me to myself. And, oh, sorry. Can we start over? Yep, we'll start over. And the Pharisees, guys, are those who are, are so quick to look down their nose at people. And they are not happy when God's mercy comes to other people. And you know why? Because they think they're better. And I just want to, I just want to kind of, I'm saying that so I can say this to you guys. Okay, I confess my Pharisee, you know, inkling at times, you know. So if you find yourself looking down your nose at people, it's because you think you're better. And that's pharisaical. It's self-righteous. And so let's all, can, can we all watch out, watch out for that and be aware of that? Raise your hand if you're with me. Let's, let's not be that way, shall we? But those guys were thrilled that God wanted them. Let's continue with the story. Verse 3 to 7. Jesus told this parable, saying to them, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? Well, of, of course you do. And when he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 persons who need no repentance. There's, there's three, we're going to look at three different parables here, and there's three components. Somebody's lost, somebody's found, and God says rejoice. And so he's just telling a story that's self-evident. You have, you have 100 sheep and one of them wanders off. You leave the other 99 they're in the wilderness, but apparently they're, they're okay. They're being watched or something, or the sheepdog's keeping them in line or something like that. And, he, and you leave those, and you go, after, you go after the one. And guys, this is exactly like the parable of the banquet, isn't it? They won't come in, go out there and invite more people. They won't go in, go out there and invite more people. God desperately, it's not like he needs us, but he deeply and desperately wants us to be in his kingdom with him. And so Jesus is saying to the Pharisees and the scribes who were looking down their nose at everybody else, how can you guys not understand this? You care more about a lost animal than you do about a person. Well, you will exalt an animal over a person when you think you're better than the person. 
I don't know if anybody in this room has the bumper sticker. Please forgive me. You ever seen those bumper stickers? They're kind of cute. You know, there's a Christian one that says, God is my co-pilot. Have you ever seen those? There's another one that says, dog is my co-pilot. It's kind of a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek, you know, poke in the ribs kind of thing. But there are some people that probably do value their pets more than they value people. But by that subdued little moan there, I think some of you guys were saying, yeah, we've seen that. Jesus is just simply saying, you guys would do that for an animal, but you won't do it for a person. But my Father in heaven loves those people. You despise them, but God loves them. My Father loves them, and he wants them. And I pray that my heart would be more like that. I pray that our hearts would be more like that, right? Guys, I'm just, speak, I'm just feeling very candid today, if I may. Well, I have the microphone, so I'm going to, you know. So, um, You know, it's not enough just to kind of tolerate people. It's, I mean, it's, good, it's better to tolerate them than to be aggressively angry. So if that's where you're at, well, then, then that's something. But, but as a Christian, did Jesus just tolerate you or did he seek you out? He sought you out. When you wanted nothing to do with him, he wanted everything to do with you. And that's the beautiful heart of God. And it's like, Lord, make my heart that way. I don't want to congratulate myself because I bought the, the bum on the street a burrito and then despise the guy that's walking by over here who didn't. I want to love that guy as much as I love this guy. I want to love people. And recently, the, the Lord's just been doing that work in me. It's like, you're better than you used to be, but you're not there yet, buddy. <laughs> you know, it's like, and I want, to be, I want to get closer to that. And that's the heart of God. And there's joy in heaven, verse 7, when one sinner repents. More than the 99 that are already okay. Of course there's joy for them. But there's an immediate joy for the one who repents. Verse 8, he says now, uh, uh, the first one was the parable of the lost sheep, now the parable of the lost coin. Verse 8, what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she's found it, She calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, in the same way, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And the word repent means to have a change of mind, a change of direction. Somebody comes to the end of themselves and realizes, Wow, I'm away from God. I need to get back to God. You know, there's something that's kind of tucked in there. If you look at the, on, we're, on the we're on page two of the notes under the title Lost Coin, uh, number three there, note, it's interesting that Jesus portrayed the searching one as a woman because women were lower class citizens in Israel. So Jesus made a lower class person the hero of the story. All you ladies should be going, whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> Jesus made a woman the hero. And the Pharisees would have been kind of offended. It's kind of like, not only, not only you know, does God want these people, but God can use a woman as a hero too. And it was kind of a little bit of a poke in the ribs, I think. But the same idea, there's joy in the presence of the angels when one sinner repents. Now verse 11, long, long passage here, goes down to verse uh, 32. This is called the parable of the the prodigal son or the lost son. Remember, somebody's lost, somebody's found, and there's joy in heaven. Verse 11, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. When do you normally get an inheritance from, from a relative? When they die. This young man was saying, Dad, I I don't want to stick around until you die. I I want your money now. (laughs) And he's not saying, I want your money now so I can get married and build a house next to your house so I can stay here and take care of you. He's saying, I want your money now uh, so I can go party. And and I want your money now, which I'm eventually going to get. Check this out, guys. This is such a, a slap in the face. I want your money, but I don't want you. That's what he's saying. I want your money. I don't want you. How does that dad feel? Horrible. 
And, and the, the parable, there, you have to look for the parallels here. That's what we have so often done to God, haven't we? I don't want you. God says, I want you. I'm having a banquet. I want you there. I don't want you. I still want you. So this, this young man is greatly insulting his father, but don't miss, guys, uh, verse 12. The father, give me the portions of goods that falls to me, so he divided to them his livelihood. So if there's two sons, the older son would get two-thirds, the younger son would get one-third, so the younger son gets his one-third, but the older son gets his two-thirds too, and he's not objecting. The father's going to be the hero in the story. The younger son's going to be the, the one that comes back. The older son is going to be the hidden villain. And he represents the Pharisees. So the, the, the older son doesn't say, hey, brother, you're being super rude to dad. He's going, hmm, I would never ask for it, but I don't mind. I'll take that money too, dad. So it's kind of a double insult. One is more obvious than the other. Verse 13, so he gives both of them their money, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. That's where we get that term, the prodigal son. Prodigal means wasteful. When, you, when there's a car in front of you at a stoplight, and, and the exhaust uh, smoke is coming out, and then it dissipates, that's what prodigal is. It, it's there, and then it's gone. That's, that's the visual image that I, that I was told one time. It's like on a cold day when you exhale, you can see your breath for a minute and then it's gone. That's what this guy did with his money. It was there for a minute and then it was gone. Not, not to be recovered. So he wasted his possessions on prodigal living, verse 14, but when he had spent it all, <clears throat> there arose a severe famine in that land and he began to be in want. So circumstances are getting his attention. Circumstances can get our attention, can't they? Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. Verse 15, the indication is that he's no longer in Israel. So now he's in a Gentile nation, and the Jews hated the Gentiles. They wanted nothing to do with the Gentiles. The Pharisees, when they would walk through the marketplace, they had long flowing robes. They would pull them in like this, so they, they, not even their robe would touch a Gentile. And when they come back from the marketplace, they'd wash their hands in case they touched something that a Gentile had touched. I think Jesus knows how to, how to step on toes, doesn't he? He knows how to poke you in the eye a little bit. Because these Pharisees are going to realize, oh man, you know, we're the guilty ones. The father in the story is, is, is the hero. So he joins himself to a citizen of that country, bad for a Jew, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine, super bad for a Jew, because those are unclean animals. They're off, they're off limits to Jewish people. Verse 16, and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. This guy's coming to the, to the end of his rope. The pigs were eating better than he was. That's, <laughs> it's bad, you know, it's bad. I, I'm grateful for my time in the pigsty. I think I saw some of you there. <laughs> I think we were in the pigsty together. I needed to be in the pigsty so I could come to the end of myself. I did, I, part of me put myself in the pigsty and then, and then a famine came into the land and other things kept me there. But we're going to see that this guy comes to his senses. Like, what am I doing here? This is ridiculous. The, I, I, you know, if I find a genie in a bottle, I'll rub it and wish to become a pig. At least then I could eat, you know. It's like the pigs are eating better than he was. Verse 16, he would gladly have filled his stomach with the paws that the swain ate, swine ate, but nobody gave him anything. Verse 17, but when he came to himself, when he came to his senses, what a beautiful phrase that is. God had mercy on him in a distant land when he's, you know, ankle deep in a pigsty. <laughs> feeding pigs. When, when, when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? Now, now there was two kinds of servants in a Jewish home in those days. 
there was like the family servants. They were kind of like, they, were, they weren't blood relatives, but they were like relatives. You know, they were, they were constantly with the family. And then there were hired servants, like when we have the harvest, you know, here in, in Napa Valley, there's guys that are hired just for the harvest. They're hired servants. They're not part of the family. They eat out in the servants' quarters. The family servants would, would eat inside the house. So the hired servants are the lowest, lowest form of servants. And this guy is saying to himself, verse 17, how many of my father's hired servants, they even have it better than I do. They have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger. This is what I'll do. He's come to his senses. Guys, he's repenting. Dad, I don't want you. I want your money. I got my money. I have all these friends as long as I have money. I'm running out of money. I'm out of money. There's a famine in the land. I'm working for a Gentile. I'm feeding pigs. Oh, no. You know, it's like, (laughs) and and God uses those times, guys, when we kind of dig a hole and start falling into it or do fall into it. He uses those times to get our attention. To say, you know what? I'm tired of self-rule. Look at the, look at the front page on, on your notes. The beautiful end of self-rule. The beautiful end of self-determination. Up to this point, the guy has been ruling his own life. And look where it took him. And some of us might say, at one point in our life, well, you deserve it. Just die there, you know. You shamed your father. You embarrassed your community. You wasted what God was going to give you. You deserve it. But over here, here's the, here's the master of the banquet saying, but I want him at my table. Can you see that? It's just amazing to me. God's heart for people. He comes to his senses, verse 18, I will arise and go to my father. I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. Notice the chronology. First and foremost, I sinned against God. Secondly, I sinned against you. I'm no longer, verse 19, worthy to be called your son. That's humility. He could have asked to be restored to his former position, but he doesn't even feel like he deserves that. He's, he's, not, he's not demanding anything. He's asking for mercy. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your, what, hired servants. I'll take the lowest place. I'm not demanding anything. I don't deserve anything. Verse 20, and he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him. It makes me think the father was like upstairs looking out the window. You know, if they had binoculars in those days, it's like, sun alert, sun alert. I think that's him. He looks dirty and skinny, but I think that's him, you know. <laughs> and the father goes, look, let's, let's read it. He rose and came to his father. When he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. And he ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Now, this, is, this is so packed. <laughs> have you ever seen old guys run? <laughs> I should have made a video, you know. It's not a pretty thing, <laughs> seeing an old guy run, you know. I love Mike Tyson, but that, that fight the other night, you know. I love you, Mike, but, you know, it's like, it's just not pretty. But in the Jewish culture, a father would never run to a son, and he would never run in public. That's putting the son above you. You're, you know, the father probably would have had a right in the eyes of the community to say, my son's coming, put down broken glass and make him go on his hands and knees across broken glass to come to me and beg forgiveness. And everybody probably would have said, yeah, that's probably what he deserves. But the father goes running. The father um, dishonors himself in a way to go meet his son. He loves him so much. He wants him back in the house. So not only kind of physically was it kind of weird, but culturally, there was just a no-no, but the father didn't care. Guys, love, love trumps the culture, doesn't it? Love trumps what is, what is expected by everybody else. I remember years ago, we got a little time, I remember years ago when we first moved here, and it was in the 90s, we moved here in 91, but I remember a, a teenager who was extremely disrespectful, and I got called to the house, and there was an argument, and I've told this story once here before, and there was an argument, and it spilled out to the street, and the, the teenager was cursing at, at the parent, and the parent got down on one knee on the sidewalk and was pleading. And I'm like, bring that kid over here, I'm going to slap some sense into him. But the, but the parent was on, his, on their knee in public, 
saying, please come home. I was like, I never forget that. And that's what love will do. Love, love doesn't care if people disagree or love doesn't care if, if I look foolish. or lo- Merciful, gracious love is, is just going to go to any, any means to win that person back. And uh, that, that impacted me greatly. It reminds me of the story. The story reminds me of it. Verse 20, he arose, came to his father. When he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and, and, ro- and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. A Pharisee would have said, he's been with pigs. He's got to bathe first. Don't kiss the, the swine boy, you know? And, and, and dad didn't care. I was like, I can wipe that off later. My son's home. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and in your sight I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hands and sandal on his feet. There, there was no reparations that were called for. There was no repayment of, of, of the debt or of, you owe me this, and you're going to sleep in the servants' quarters, and none of that. You're my son. You've always been my son. I want you back. And he, and he clothes him in royalty, puts a ring on his, fin- on his hand, sandals on his feet, verse 23, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. Fatted calf, not just some regular calf, but one that's super tasty. It's the ribeye calf, you know? It's like, b- b- bring the best. We're having a party. My son is home. And the Pharisees would have stood outside the door and said, what are you doing? He deserves God's judgment. Yeah, he does, but he's repented. He deserves your judgment. Yeah, he does, but he's repented. And I'm rejoicing. Lost, found, rejoice. Bring the fatted calf here and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this son of mine, this, for this my son was dead and he is alive again. He was lost and found and they began to be merry. So, I mean, th- you know, wouldn't it be great if that was the end of the story? You know, you know, you start seeing the credits roll and it fades to black and, you know, then you get up and have some cocoa and it's a nice, warm, snuggly day. But it's not the end of the story, you know. Verse 25, now his older son was in the field. He's out working. Remember, the older son has received two-thirds of the inheritance, Well, I wonder why he's still there. Maybe he's just biding his time because he wants to get the house too. He's just waiting to receive everything that's going to be his. He, he's there, guys. He's there, but he's not there. He's in church, but his heart's not in church. He's, he's a Christian, but he's not a Christian because it's not 100%. He's just there, and we're going to see that. Verse 25, his older son was in the field. He came and drew near to the house. He heard music and dancing, so he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. You, you know, you would hope that the brother would go, man, I've been praying for that guy, that knucklehead. I'm going to give him a noogie on the head and give him a hug, and we're going to eat, and we're going to have a great time, and we're going to dance like we used to when we were kids, and so grateful, and he's, there's none of that. There's no joy at all. Verse 28, he was angry and would not go in. I'm angry. I'm angry, Dad, that you were merciful to him. I'm angry, Dad, that you humbled yourself in public. I'm angry that you kissed his swine-soaked neck and put a ring on his finger. I'm angry, Dad, that you're so kind and loving because I deserve it. He was angry, verse 28. He would not go in, therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you, Notice, he didn't say these many years I've been loving you. He didn't say these many years we've been enjoying a great father-son relationship. I've been serving you. I deserve more. Pharisees, we're not like them. We deserve God's love. We deserve a place in God's kingdom. And they don't because they're like this and we're like this. This guy was like a Pharisee. Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. He's resentful. Verse 30. This is so, words are so indicative of a heart. But as soon as the son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. This son of yours. He didn't say as soon as his brother of mine. Not my, he's not my relative, he's your relative. And he didn't even use his name son of yours. It's like the Pharisees. 
these guys come in to, to hang out with Jesus and they're mad. You shouldn't be hanging out with them. As soon as the son of yours came who devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. This, this young boy had done so many things wrong, you guys. It's, it's so many things. Verse 31. And he said to him, Son, you're always with me. All that I have is yours. We, I've always been here for you. We've always had the opportunity to have a relationship. You've always been in the house. I've always provided for you. I've taken care of you. Yes, you've worked for me, but I've always taken care of you. I've always been here for you. When your brother walked away, he walked away from our relationship. You've always been here, and I've been available to you for this relationship. But I would imagine the father was thinking, but you chose work instead of relationship. Son, you're always with me. All that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad. For your brother, not just my son, but he's your brother, he was dead and is alive again, and he was lost and he was found. The goody two-shoes guys was the, was the villain. <laughs> Everybody check your shoes. Now, I'm going to be a little silly here. Now, I want everybody to come forward. I'm just (laughs) teasing. Come forward in your heart. God, am I a Pharisee? Am I angry when scoundrels, when drug addicts, when prostitutes, when homeless people, when people that have forfeited their family, when people that have cursed you to your face, when people that have been in jail and done unspeakable things, am I angry when they repent? We should rejoice. It's a hard thing. Guys, I struggle with it. Therefore, you know, I I struggle with it. So I'm I'm figuring you guys are probably better than me, but you're not perfect, you know. So you probably struggle with it too. I, I get angry when people treat people badly. I'm sure you guys do too. When they destroy their lives, when they waste their health, when they destroy a marriage, when they destroy families when they shame the church. I'm angry at all of those things, you know? And there's a place for righteous anger. There certainly is. We should be angry when people hurt other people. We should be. Not with an intention to destroy them, but we should be offended and angry. But the love of God is greater than that, isn't it? I want the the love of God to be the, the, the preeminent thing in my heart. There is a place to be angry, but I want his love to be greater. And these guys were missing it. And that, that younger brother and those tax collectors and sinners, they were coming to the end of self-rule. They were, they, were, they were just saying, here I am, Lord, I have nothing. I'm nothing. Receive me. And, and, and God in heaven rejoices over that. But if there's any kind of Pharisee in us, we're like, ah, get out the broken glass. <laughs> By the way, these, these examples that I come up with, you know, I don't read a book to get them. <laughs> I just feel them. <laughs> That's me. It's terrible, you know. I n- I've never made anybody crawl a- a- across broken glass, you know, when they've come to apologize to me. But, but I'll think it. Like, shame on me, <laughs> you know. Well, if they do this and do this and apologize and describe themselves in the worst ways, maybe I'll forgive them, you know. It's like, no, they're repenting. They are coming to the end of self-rule. And that's a beautiful thing. The end of self. Take up your cross. Come to the end of yourself. Now I have to come to the end of my my holy self-righteousness and I have to take up my cross and love them the way that God does. That's why I say I think being a Christian might be the hardest thing there is in the world. But it's the best, isn't it? Amen? It's the best. Like Nacho Libre would say, it's the best. (laughs) It's the best. It's absolutely, there's nothing better than coming to the end of yourself and letting your heart be directed by God. This morning, if you have a little Pharisee in you, kind of of probably we all do, may the Lord rescue us from that, amen? May we pray to be filled with his love. 
And if you've been far away from the Lord, man, he's looking and he wants you at his banquet table. But if you come, come, be ready to, be, to come to the end of yourself. You have to. You have to love him supremely. Let me pray for us. Well, let me see if there's any questions that were submitted. What is a lukewarm Christian? Well, I think a lukewarm Christian is probably somebody uh, that was loving God supremely at some time in their life, and now they're being uh, tempted by the world, and they're starting to lose their love for God, and they're starting to, to love the things of the world, and they're compromising. They're compromising out of fear maybe of losing a job, or they're compromising because they don't want to be a single person anymore, or they're compromising because uh, their friends are saying this and that, and they're feeling like they're on the outside of their, of their circle of friends, so they have to go along with what the crowd is saying. They're compromising. They're not loving God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength anymore. Uh, thankfully, for a long time, that is recoverable. I, I was more than a lukewarm Christian. I was a totally backslidden Christian. But then there was a knock, there was a knock on the gate at the pigsty, <laughs> and they were calling my name. So... I think you can be like what Jesus said and uh, lose your saltiness. I think that can happen. Theological debate, that's where I stand on it so far. Hey, if you start losing your saltiness, just don't let it happen. How would you describe being baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire? Matthew eleven three eleven. 3, 11. Well, this is, this is John the Baptist at the Jordan River talking about Jesus coming, that he would baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. Holy Spirit is the third person of the triune Godhead, so to be baptized means to be immersed in something, and so uh, you are immersed in the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God starts to just uh, work its way through every part of your being. The fire is, 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 is uh, argued about or disagreed about. It probably, it's probably a purifying fire, I would say, at this point. If you come to Jesus, expect to, to go through the fire to get some of the junk burned off. And don't wiggle. It'll take longer. Just, <laughs> just let, it, let him do it. <laughs> let him do it. Let's stand together. Lord, thank you so much for your great love. What a tremendous passage, passages we've seen today. Your deep, deep, deep love for all of humanity. How you love the lost. You love the found, but Lord, how you in a special way love the lost and desire them to come to you. Lord, uh, we pray for every person in this room that they would know how good you are, Lord, but that they would also know if they come to you, it's, it's all or nothing. And Lord, for, for us who are in the fold, who are part of the flock of God, may, may there be no pharisaical inclination in us at all. Save us from that, Lord, we pray. And if we've been that way, Father, forgive us. So, Lord, we want to walk in your grace and your love and your mercy, and we want to be salty for Napa, and we want to bring a wonderful flavor to our city, and we want to be a preserving force, Lord, in our city, a preserving agent to keep the rottenness out, Lord. So use us for your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. How great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. Amen. Stay for lunch, stay for lunch, stay for lunch.